Hello and welcome to Portfolio Matters. Happy New Year to our viewership. In and, today's and, and prosperous New Year, Keith. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's hope for a better 22 and 21. Um, in today's podcast, we are going to be doing a preview of the markets and commodity markets with some suggestions for which shares you might want to look at if you have a particular view of a commodity or an asset. But before we get into it, Richard will read the disclaimer. Thank you, Keith. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. Keith, let's get into our prognostications. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to give a brief overview of the markets and then go through markets in general and then commodities one by one and uh, give you our thoughts on where we think they might be heading in the coming year. So we did before Christmas a special on the business cycle and we believe that we are towards the start of a new business cycle and that when COVID restrictions finally come off that businesses and consumers have savings with which they can spend and drive a new business cycle. So I think that 2022 will see decent economic growth subject to COVID. Richard, your thoughts? Yeah, um, subject to COVID is quite a big subject too, of course, because it tends to strike when we're least expecting it. Um, but uh, there's still a huge amount of money sloshing, sloshing around in the system. And um, all of the uh, indicators that we spoke about up, up, until, up until Christmas are pretty positive. So we should be going into um, certainly the beginning of 2022 in, uh, in a good state in terms of the eco economic expansion. Yeah, I'd also say that when COVID restrictions finally come off, in those countries where there have been yet more restrictions. I think people are just going to want to go out and spend and go to the cinema, go to the theatre. So I think you could see actually very strong growth, stronger than people anticipate. The caveat is, you know, had, had Omicron been um, virulent and caused serious illness, mm. we would be in a very different place to where we are now. Yeah. And um, there is always a possibility of a new variant coming out that does that and is highly contagious. Under those circumstances, things are a little different. But fingers crossed that won't happen. Yes, fingers crossed. It would be nice to finally see it at the end of COVID. Yeah. So with that in mind, where do we think we are on the equity market cycle? And essentially, I don't think we've changed much since uh, we last covered this back in July. I think we are still in the phase where you should see good returns for equities. So phase three, growth. Earnings grow faster than PE multiples. Markets, companies with very high earnings expectations, I would be wary of um, by holding those because now we are in the stage where we get real earnings and you actually can compare expectations to the reality and generally that tends to be bad for growth stocks as inflations have been bid up very high. Richard, your thoughts? Yeah, I think the um, we we sort of need to know where inflation is going to go. Um, various parties say different things that we've got the inflationists who think it's going to go higher and we've got the deflationists who think it's a flash in the pan and will disappear. Mm. And I think that from an economic point of view, the what happens to inflation over the course of the next six months is very important um simply because if inflation really does appear to be embedded interest rates will go have have to go up in some way even if it's the market that bids them up rather than central banks raising them and i think we get into a bit of a sticky situation then in which case uh you know we, the, the the hand moves rapidly around the cycle yes um, i agree with that the my main predictions for this this cycle 
is it's going to be volatile. And yeah. in, rather than making lots of long-term predictions, I'll be watching what's happening and reacting. I think that's, that's very sensible, Keith. You, you have to uh, keep your finger on the pulse. And if things don't appear to be moving in your way, according to the way you read it, probably better to cut your losses and uh, keep your cash rather than and, um, try and sit it out um, where the things can become unstable quite quickly for the reasons we've, we've been discussing. Ag agreed. But that all said, I'm 100% in. I'm basically I've, um, entirely in equities. But if uh, anything changes, my view changes, then you have to be nimble and get out. Remember, the number one priority for private investors is not to lose money. And that should be very much in my mind as we go into the new year. Yeah. OK, moving on to financial markets. So the S&P 500, which has had an enormous run. I, despite the fact that I'm bullish equities, I think it's just gone way too far, driven by growth stocks and the leadership is narrowing, narrowing, narrowing to just a few big tech companies that seem to go relentlessly higher. And that is never a good sign. So I am bearish on the S&P 500. Likewise, Keith, I think um, my bullishness in stocks is, is mostly confined to resource type stocks. Mm, value. Um, and um, not to um, tech companies. Um, and uh, companies trading on very high multiples for reasons that we don't really understand. So that's why it's a sell. It's not a, it's not a don't be in equities. It's to be very careful which equities you're in. Yes. Of, uh, indication. Yep. And more of the same, because essentially the performance of the S&P is being driven by a few big NASDAQ names. Yeah, Apple and Alphabet, etc. Meta. So I'm very bearish the NASDAQ. I think you've, we've seen the breadth continually narrowing and at some stage this has got to break. Although we are recording this on Monday the 3rd of January and I see just before we started recording that Tesla is up over 10% today. So timing is always an issue. It is. And I just to draw viewers' um, attention to the, the uh, table that we put up a week or two ago where you can see that many of the high flying constituents of the NASDAQ have in fact, actually, in fact actually crashed and burned over the last few months. And this chart does not reflect that, but had you been invested in them, um, then uh, things like DocuSign, for example, which yeah. is down 60%, then you would not be feeling pleased with yourself. But the all share, you know, the all share is very different from the NASDAQ. I mean, it's very heavily weighting in financials and resource companies and its value. So I um, have very large overweighting, obviously, in the UK equities, and I am bullish on uh, the uh, FTSE. Richard? Yeah, same really, Keith. I mean, it, FTSE has gone hardly anywhere for... Um, I, I think it's hard, gone hardly anywhere for many years, actually, hasn't it, if you extend the... Um, yes. Well, so this... Back. The, this point here is uh, 2008, and since then it's up what 10%, 15%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, there's some very nice high yielding companies in it, as Keith says, it's resources and financials. Interest rate, interest rate scenario is rising, so that's good for financials. Um, again, you have to pick your um, pick your company, but of course, there's very different weighting of the highly valued tech tech stocks in the FTSE all share. Well, I'm, 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 I'm not buying anymore, but I am holding. Um, and um, first trading day of today, as I, as I look up at uh, the price of Bitcoin, it's down 1.5%. Uh, excellent start to the new year. It's a <laughs> so I'm still holding, but uh, it would have been nice had it. Uh, I mean, obviously, it does actually trade 24-7, but you know what I mean. So, uh, but I, I still think there is um, some life in it yet. Mm. And I'll let everybody know when I think there isn't any life in it. Well, well, you've done very well, Adam. Keith thinks there's no life in it already. Really. 
I just think they're digital tulips. You know, they're fine. They're a good speculative asset, but their intrinsic value is zero. And at some stage, they will return to it. But, you know, you've done very well out of trading it, Richard. So, you know, good for you. Well, fingers crossed, Keith. Um, exactly the same with Ethereum. Um, hold by, I, I, um, and I wouldn't buy any more. I've got some. And um, I think that, although you look at that chart, if you look at the log chart, as we do from time to time, it looks a little bit different. Um, the log chart of a of an exponential growth stock that has yet to crash and burn always looks good. On to energy commodities. Okay, so crude oil. Well, it's a big year for crude, having had a very strong 2021. Essentially, in the next few months, OPEC will release 400,000 barrels a day increase per month until they run out of spare capacity, which is meant to be around March. Now, what happens when OPEC run out of spare capacity? If demand exceeds supply, you will see energy prices, crude prices rising quite quickly. That said, all the forecasts are for a surplus to develop over the next six months, and then the market to go into deficit towards the end of the year. Now, there are good reasons for expecting that not to be true. And if demand stays high, and during December, we should have seen seasonal builds in inventories, and we didn't, we saw draws. So if demand continues high, you could see crude prices start to rise from here and rise quickly. Now, my big concern about 2022 is what happened in natural gas in Europe. And de energy demand is very price inelastic. And if we get an excess of demand over supply and there's no, we run out of OPEC spec supply, then there are no marginal producers apart from US shale, which has shown remarkable discipline this so far. And you could see the oil price rise very quickly with negative implications for equity markets and the global economy. So when I talk about volatility, I'm watching crude. And if crude starts to spike, it could be very bad for everyone. Just to clarify, what is it that um, the Saudis are doing or OPEC is doing? Okay, so back in March 2020, OPEC took millions of barrels. I, from memory, I think it's like 8 million barrels out of the market because right. was obviously de demand completely collapsed. And if you remember, WTI hit minus $40 a barrel because people just yeah. couldn't store. There was so much oil going into storage. They were run out of storage. So what they've done is they came to an agreement whereby they would slowly release capacity back onto the market. And their current agreement is that they're going to increase steadily by 400,000 barrels per day per month. And they've been doing this over the course of 2021 and right. until they run out of spare capacity, at which point it's everyone can pump what they like. And that point is due to be reached in about March next year, I believe. Right. At that point, we discover how much spare capacity OPEC really have. Now, you'll see that actually Russia's production has plateaued. So it is allowed, according to its quota, to keep increasing production over the coming months yeah. but actually is run out of capacity and our question is how many opec countries still have spare capacity certainly a few do but i doubt the spare capacity is what they say it is yeah interesting so watch this space really absolutely and if we get international travel back strongly in 2022 then you'll yeah. see the return of demand for jet fuel, which has really been absent for the last two years. Yeah. Okay, so if you're interested in crude, here are some of the companies that 
viewers on our Discord channel like. And thank you to various people listed at the bottom for contributing to our poll. Um, of those, I would single out i3 Energy, which we did a share talk on recently, and World Dutch Shell, which is moving its jurisdiction from joint jurisdiction from the Netherlands to just being UK one, and where, which will enable it to do loads of share buybacks. Okay, coal. Now, coal is a difficult one because obviously it is enemy number one for the um, energy transition, but China is continues to burn an increasing amount of it, and we are not investing in new coal capacity. And the reality is, we are going to need metallurgical coal for m very many years because there is no substitute for coal in the steel making process. Essentially, the way you make steel is you put a load of iron ore, which is iron oxide, in with some coal, and then you get out carbon dioxide and iron. So we need coal. So I think I am actually, I'm bullish on metallurgical coal um, because I don't think that we're adding any new capacity. Yeah, so um, I, I'm reasonably bullish on metallurgical coal and my only coal investment is um, Colonial Coal, which is a Canadian company, which is developing a coal resource. Um, and um, that is metallurgical coal. And so I'm, I'm hanging on to that on the, on the basis you've just described, Keith. Keith. Um, right. But I, it's like all of these things, isn't it? It's, it's difficult. There is, there is plenty of um, thermal coal around. It's just in the wrong places, particularly with China not wanting to buy anything from Australia. So I think that um, it's, it's hard to know where this is going to end up because a lot the, the, the market is distorted by political considerations. And if they resolve, mm. then I think the price of coal uh, will, will stabilize or, or possibly fall. But if they don't resolve, there's nothing to stop it doing what it did in the autumn again. Yeah. And I think metallurgical coal is probably more stable because its, it's demand is, is um, I think it's less, or I'm, I may be talking nonsense here, but I, my feeling is that the demand is less politically labile, as it were. These are some coal miners that you might be interested in. Um, Thungela Resources are listed in the UK, South African coal mine, which has environmental concerns. Contango Holdings is a is developing a coal mine in Zimbabwe, the uh, metallurgical coal. Richard, do you want to talk uh, briefly about Colonial? Yes, well, it's um, it's developing a, a coal reserve in uh, uh, British Columbia in Canada. It's obviously a politically stable in, environment in which to be doing it. Um, and um, I think the ultimately the the intention will be that they sell the resource to one of the big miners. And um, the chairman and a couple of the directors have done this before, so they have a, a track record of developing the resource and then 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 selling it um so really it's just a question of sitting tight and waiting for one of the big um my big big um, coal producers coal miners to purchase it and um you know that obviously that depends upon their view of the world's demand for metallurgical coal but as keith rightly says the only other way of, of um, producing steel is to use hydrogen and hydrogen is produced mm -hmm. by electrolyzing water which requires electricity, which we don't have enough of anyway, which is why we're burning coal in power stations. So you, um, it really it does seem uh, that there might be a few sort of showcase examples of this. This is how you can use hydrogen to produce steel from, uh, produce iron rather from uh, iron ore. But actually from an energy uh, mm. consumption point of view, it makes no sense for the world to do that until it has significantly more electricity production than it has at the moment. So this is Dutch natural gas futures on a daily basis. And you've seen there's a huge spike this year, which we covered extensively in the weeklies. And we won't go into again here, but it's now coming off. And hopefully you will see 
an increase in supply from Russia, but you'll definitely see loads of LNG cargoes coming across the Atlantic, and that should ease the crisis going forward. And uh, as we move into spring, obviously, demand for heating, etc., should fall. So I am bearish on spot prices. I think we have seen the peak. But is this going to happen again next year? Well, all the um, political commentary has been on mitigating the effects of the gas price spike. There has been very little done to address the underlying causes. And if Russia next year does not increase supply, then I think we see the whole thing happening again. So I am mm. bearish on the spot natural gas price, but I remain compared to where it was at the start of the year, I just can't see the natural gas prices going back there. So bullish. Mm. Yeah, so my comment watch for fun is I really don't have a, a, a clue where this price is going. Uh, and for Keith says, he says there's so many uncertainties, there's political uncertainty. You don't really know what's happening with the supply and demand equation. Um, there is a lot of natural gas has not spiked in the US. It hasn't really changed price very much, but they're now starting to export large quantities of liquefied natural gas to Asia and Europe who are in a bidding war for it because they're not getting it from Russia. Um, so I really don't know where the price is going to go. But I would say that if you have a company that invests in natural, that is in the natural gas sector, it's probably sensible to hold it because it's probably going to be far more profitable uh, this year than it was mm. last year because the base price is probably going to be substantially higher. Uh, even if it pulls back a bit further from the spike. Yes, no, I agree with that. So here are a few investment ideas. If you're interested in natural gas, we have done share talks on quite a few of these. Serica Independent Harbour. Um, if you're interested, please pause the video and take a look. But these are just ideas. We encourage you to do your own research if you're interested in any. Now, the, another side effect of the massive spike in natural gas is that European fertilizer manufacturers have largely stopped operation because their input prices are too high compared to the sale price of fertilizer. So fertilizer prices have spiked and that presents an investment opportunity if you're a fertilizer producer with cheap energy. So here are a few uh, fertilizer ideas suggested by our Discord viewers. Thank you to them. They're listed at the bottom. Okay, on to uranium, Richard. Well, I think um, I am long-term bullish on uranium. Over the next 12 months, I'm, I'm not sure whether the price will just sort of settle around about roughly where it is. Um, the, um, the long-term bullishness is as a consequence of the energy shortage, and only the EU have recently announced in the last few days they've announced that uranium, that nuclear power, has now been designated green energy, along with gas power, gas power, mm. uh, gas generating electricity, and clear. And Macron is saying that President Macron in France is, is saying France is going to be investing heavily in nuclear energy. We're going to be investing. Everybody will be investing heavily in nuclear energy. So I think that. Um, in the long term, the price is going to go up. So I think it's a long term buy and hold. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree with that at all. I think the spot price has been squeezed higher by Sprott and his yeah. um, ETF buying up all the uh, available uranium. And that makes the spot price rather hostage to private investor inflows and outflows and you know in the short yeah. term i've just got no idea where that goes you know if, if there are more inflows into the etf it could go even higher but then if it fails to go higher then they could all just decide to sell and you see a load of uranium flowing back onto the market so yeah, short term exactly. i've got no idea yeah that is the problem with it isn't it yeah okay on to industrial commodities aluminium well, aluminium 
is congealed electricity. And we know Goldman Sachs have um, been talking about the fact that because aluminium has not been terribly profitable for a while, there's been a lack of new capacity coming on stream. So in the next few years, we will move from having a structural oversupply to structural deficit, which is long-term bullish. In addition, the European smelters have had a torrid time over the last year as electricity prices have gone through the roof. So all that means, um, I think aluminium prices have to rise because the cost of the inputs, electricity, has gone up everywhere. So strong buy. Yeah. Yeah. I'd agree with that. So here are some aluminium investment ideas. I would highlight Norsk Hydro, which has all its electricity is from uh, hydroelectric. So that should be cheap and unaffected by the natural gas prices. And EN Plus Group is a Russian company listed in London and Moscow that has enormous hydroelectric dams in Siberia and produces aluminium from there and is very low cost. But obviously you have the jurisdiction risk. Do your own research. Cobalt. Well, it's had a good run. Yeah. So, I think that's the problem, isn't it, Keith? It's, it's, um, it's had a good run. We know it's a battery metal. Um, it is over. It's about two and a half times the price it was a year and a bit ago. Mm. It's it's hard to say it's going to fly. Uh, it's hard to say it's going to go down. Yeah. Um, because of the demand. So I would say it's yeah it's very difficult to um, to, to determine. I, I, if you look at 2018, it's got beautiful head and shoulders, hasn't it? And actually, head and shoulders almost perfect so you could look at it now and say well actually it's halfway through a head and shoulders mm. you know with the left shoulder at 50 55,000 yeah. so i would say be a bit careful of that one yeah i mean the thing is we're investing in all the battery metals you're essentially betting on existing technology in an area where technology is is developing very quickly and we know that you know people are doing their best to substitute cobalt because a lot of it comes from the DRC and is environmentally questionable. So at the moment, I think, you know, there don't seem to be that many alternatives and the price has been squeezed higher, but I wouldn't put too much money on it continuing. So yeah, weak by be wary. Copper. Okay, so this is a long-term chart from, of copper and it has squeezed up over the last couple of years, but has not gone parabolic like some of the other industrial commodities. I think that copper is going to be absolutely essential for the electrification and you know, green. the green transition just adds to already strong demand for copper. And the bottom line is we've been searching for copper for a very long time and we have used up a lot of the easily available resources. Therefore, in order to increase the supply of copper, which we need to do in the future, we are really going to have to search hard and develop marginal um, resources, which will be energy intensive and that will have forced the uh, copper price up. So I'm a buyer. Completely agree, Keith. So these are some copper companies you might be interested in. Now, one of the big problems of um, copper is the biggest producers are in the Andes, in Chile and Peru, <clears throat> which are both voted in left-wing governments who have made yeah, yeah. noises about raising the uh, mining taxes or actually nationalizing the companies. So, for example, Antofagasta, which is a big copper miner, which is listed in London, you know, that now has quite big political risks. So beware. Um, now, Portfolio Matters, Problem Child, Rambler Metals and Mining. Take a look. This is a good year for Rambler, hopefully. And we haven't got a chart of this. 
but if you look at a chart of rambler mining it's it's been in a range for quite some time now and the price is getting up to the top of that range so i would personally i'm watching to see if it breaks out and if it does then i think that would be quite an interesting buying opportunity yes we obviously i have quite a lot of rambler so i hope it does richard Okay, on to Chromium. Now, Chromium had a mystifying bull run this year. Mystifying in the fact that iron prices collapsed when China um, enforced a reduction in steel smelting in H2. But Chromium prices continue to rise, despite the fact that it's almost exclusively used in the production of stainless steel. Now, it started to come off recently, and the bottom line is I've got no idea. No, me neither. I think uh, didn't really know why it went up. Yeah, um, don't know why it's going to go down. So I think just um, yeah, steer, steer clear really because it's so. Unless you have some inside track onto into yeah. the chromium market, you really know it very well. It's very difficult, I think, to try and understand what's going on there. Also, notice how frequently it moves between four. 44,000 and 80,000 yes. and back down again. And so it's, it, this could be just quite a standard move for it for whatever reason. Yeah. I should also say that I've asked our Discord reason, uh, viewers for um, their opinion of why the uh, we've had a bull market and got no response. So, you know, I'm not sure no anyone knows. knows. Okay. Iron ore. Right. Well, it had an extraordinary run last year. I think it's going to start heading back up, but we know we've covered the developing property prices crisis in China in some depth on the weekly. If you're interested, follow our weeklies because you know if yeah. if that develops and there's um, a drop in house building and construction in China, then you know all bets are off. So if you're interested in iron, here are some um, big iron ore producers. Lithium. <laughs> this has been an absolutely extraordinary year in lithium. I it's think what I would say about what I was what I would say about this, Keith, is that you wouldn't want to buy the metal, but it's probably well worth certainly holding if you own a lithium miner. Very well worth holding it because if they're producing their, their um, margin must must be huge yeah or the right in miners must have some huge margins so it's probably well worth holding them um but mm. at this point you certainly i don't think you'd want to enter the market either with a buying some sort of lithium etn if there is such a thing or um or a lithium miner i think it's time to sit and watch what happens and it's the sort of thing where if you own it now, you might find that in a few years' time you've got a ten bagger. But if you mm. buy it now, you might find that you you lose fifty percent in next to no time. Yeah, and no, I the the thing is, we know that there's fundamentally no lack of lithium in the Earth's crust. It's just that we haven't yeah. really looked for it before. And I so, know there are loads of lithium projects in the pipeline, and you know, high prices are their own uh, remedy in that you know anyone with a lithium asset is going to be trying to develop it now that the share price has gone up what 12 fold in a year so it's also there is this um you know the world is said that the lithium iron battery is the way that motor vehicles will be powered in future well maybe not and that's the risk you're taking with lithium that there are other technologies i think the hydrogen fuel cell is a technology that some car makers are really interested in and there are, there are other battery technologies being developed so my suspicion is that in 15 years' time, the lithium-ion battery may well not be the mm. only battery of choice for motor vehicles. It might be in the mix, yeah. but I think there will be significant competition to it. So you do need to, in the longer term, you need to understand that, that mm. it's not a one-way ticket. Magnesium, well, magnesium is even more electricity um, intensive than aluminium is. So I've, it's gone a long way in a year. So I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. Neodymium, well, 
that again has had an extraordinary year. reminder neodymium is used in magnets and a big uh, wind turbine can have a, up to a ton of neodymium in it uh, but it's had an extraordinary run, run rare earth metals and we did a share talk on all this which i uh, would urge everyone to watch rare earth metals are not rare and so Again, it's just a question of searching for them and producing them. And now we are seeing projects coming online all over the world in the next few years. Yeah. So, well, I think what I say here, Keith, is that the rare, I mean, neodymium, you can't, well, you may be able to invest in a neodymium miner, but I suspect you can't really. Um, you invest in a rare earth miner or yes. producer. So, I, I would say that investing in a rare earth producer for the long term. Is a good thing to do. You might want to time your, your entry a little bit, but I would say the only way that rare earths are going is up. Um, China, although it produces vast the vast proportion of rare earths in the world, it's produced in a highly polluting manner, mm. and also it has huge control over what is actually a crucial market for not only uh, you know, earphones but yeah. uh, missile guidance systems and so forth. So. Um, and that's not acceptable to the US and the West. So the, I think that an investment in rare earths is probably a sound investment as a diversifying mm. thing to diversify your portfolio over the next five to 10 years. Yeah. But going back to my point about the uh, miners coming online, I mean, London, you ha have three companies, small companies listed in London, which are all developing rare earth assets in Africa. Yeah. So, you know, Linus Corp yeah. is a producer. So if you want to take advantage of high near dim prices now, Linus Corp is the one. Nickel, developing nicely. Right. Yeah, yeah, buy. I think we both feel that's a buy, don't we, Keith? It's, um, yeah. The chart looks quite healthy, actually. It's a nice sort of uh, not too volatile uptrend. Um, we know that there is an impending shortage in nickel, nickel uh, mm. a few years out. Yeah. And um, I, I just feel quite comfortable personally with a, a nickel miner or two. Yeah. Now, actually, we could only think of a couple of nickel miners. Horizonte Minerals, which is developing a nickel mine. And somebody suggested Amaro Minerals, which I know nothing about. But anyway, take a look. Tin. Well, tin has had an absolutely amazing year. You know, this is the chart going back 25 years. And you'll see that current prices are unprecedented. So when this has happened before, it's only a question of time before they fall back to work. So I wouldn't be buying at this point, frankly. No. No, I wouldn't. I mean, I put neutral there because I don't really know why it went up in the first place. Um, and um, as Keith says, it's it's gone up an awful long way very quickly. And unless there's some huge new uh, demand for tin from some technology that we're unaware of, mm. then it doesn't really stack up. Yeah. Okay, ferro vanadium. Vanadium is used in strengthening steel. And as we see, hopefully increased steel demand now that Chinese smelters can ramp back up, then you should see ferro-vanadium start to creep up. It's also used in the um, vanadium redox flow battery, isn't it, Keith, which we mm. covered some months ago on uh, portfolio masses. And I, I've seen some, there's a few of those seem to be coming online now. And um, that's quite interesting because the question is, are they going to become um, a standard method for storing wind and solar energy near mm. where it's produced until yeah. it's needed in cases of overproduction? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I'm just skeptical about the battery solution to the um, renewable energy intermittency problem, because I mean, yeah you need the wind doesn't flow for days and weeks 
and batteries, a lithium battery will provide a bit of power for hours. I mean, vanadium redox flow batteries, possibly a couple of days if they're enormous. I just don't see it. They're not, they're not solutions. Now, we covered two vanadium companies in listed in London and ferro alloy resources is my entry into our discord members stock picking challenge for 2022 i think that once they get their um bankable feasibility study done on their asset in kazakhstan that the shares could fly you heard it here first now, if our alloy resources succeeds in producing um, vanadium and using a new low cost pressure cooking method, then you could see the uh, relatively small international market for vanadium flooded with new supply, which would be very bad for high cost producers. Yeah. Okay, on to precious metals gold uh, well so my my prognostication is a buy and a, it's really just a, a kiss of death isn't it so I, I, not much it's relevant to what's going to happen for the rest of the year but um it's down one and a half percent today around just about 1800 and um uh but you know what, what the hell eh? Um, mm. my view is that it is still a long-term buy yeah well I've been very, very disappointed in gold this year when we've seen inflation rising. Yeah. And I just have no, no idea where it's going to go medium term. But we're now in a rising interest rate environment, which tends to be bad for gold. So, Although I'm, we have very, very, well, we have highly negative real rates, don't we, Keith? And it should, gold yeah. should respond to the real rate, not the absolute rate. No, that's true, Richard. But the trouble is, it hasn't. You know, there's been very frustrating yeah. this year. So, yeah. mm, I'm not sure. Anyway, if you are worried about the constant money printing and you want to put some money into gold, then these are the assets that uh, some of our Discord members recommended. I would say holding physical gold via the ETF is the safest way. Okay, silver. So I um, again, I put a, a buy on that, and uh, I think silver has the attraction that if um, gold goes up because of the safety in times of inflation, um, silver will follow it. But also, silver is increasingly becoming an industrial metal and is important in the electrification of the world, um, and so therefore, there's an industrial demand for it as well. So I'm actually, I'm actually fairly bullish on silver as as viewers of our weekly podcast will know yes no i agree with you it's uh, used in solar panels i think there'll be i agree with which um platinum well platinum disappointing year on the back of the all the automakers cutting production due to the sh chip shortage that should end but in the meantime all the pgm producers have been working flat out and demand has been low so um, i suspect a stockpile is building building up which will need to be worked worked through so weak yeah. buy for me yeah um my feeling is is very similar to keith's so i certainly wouldn't chase it now rhodium is very similar very similar rationale isn't it keith to, to platinum yeah so platinum rhodium and palladium all have the same drivers essentially there are two PGM miners listed in London, which we have talked about before, Jubilee Metals and Sylvania Platinum. This is Palladium. Okay, finally moving on to bonds. <laughs> this is the Greek 10-year. And actually, when you look, this is the yield. It is really right down low. You know, it if there is a sell-off in Euros in the Eurozone, there's a recurrence of the Eurozone debt crisis. Greek bonds could have a long way to fall. Now we know the ECB is going to stop its pandemic emergency purchase program in March, but will continue to reinvest bonds that mature. But I think that will reduce one of the key, key supports 
of Greek bonds. So I would be. Well, saying... there's a there's a difference case between what the ECB says it's going to do and what it actually will do. And my view is it, it won't. It'll substitute the pandemic emergency purchase program um, and substitute something else in its place because it can't afford for the Greek yield to go up to twenty five percent. Yeah. No, I don't disagree with that. At some stage, though, there will become a point where other Europeans will object to what is essentially a fiscal transfer. Yeah. Watch this space. Um, same is true for Italy. Now, the and UK. Have we got France? Sorry? Yeah, well, have we got France as well. France? No, I haven't. <laughs> I've used the same. Now, in the case of the UK, um, inflation is very high. Bond yields continue to be mystifyingly low. And yeah. the worry is at some stage, bond markets begin to worry that inflation is persistent and that you get, you've locked in negative real yields on the 10-year and bond investors decide to get out, at which point you could have a sharp spike higher. So I would not be touching bonds. Fundamentally, and I hate to say this, the same logic applies to UK bonds and French bonds as applies to um, the peripheral Southern European bonds that the uh, government debt is too high, tax rates are too high, interest rates are too low, inflation is too high, and uh, it's not a it's not a happy place to be, in my view. Mm. Yeah. So, I have zero bonds in my portfolio, having it's a couple right. of years ago been like something like seventy percent bonds. Okay. I think that is it. So, thank you for watching. Happy New Year once again. We look forward to another positive, hopefully, and maybe hopefully less volatile year in 2022. But I suspect we're not going to get it. So be sure to, sure to tune in to the weekly as we keep you updated with events in the markets and the world over the coming year. And in the meantime, it is uh, goodbye from Richard Wheater. And it's goodbye from Keith Jordan. Goodbye. Actually, before we go... <laughs> Please can you press like and subscribe. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Full disclaimer. The material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages, or for any results obtained from use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.